This video is sponsored by Envato Elements. Hey everyone and welcome back to another very exciting Blender tutorial. In this video I want to show you how to control, generate and animate color in geometry nodes in Blender. Now as always if you want to skip all of my waffle or you just want to play with the final project file you'll find the download links as well as links to the timestamps that'll get you straight to the tutorial down in the video description. But I do want to call out that this is part three of my beginner tutorial series for how to use geometry nodes in Blender and I will assume that you have watched all of the previous parts. Also, if you're completely new to Blender, I actually have an absolute beginner tutorial series for Blender in general. And the links to all of those playlists, I'm going to drop you down below. So go and check them out first. But before we get into it, I want to give a big shout out and thank you to Envato Elements for sponsoring this video. Envato Elements is a massive online resource offering over 55 million digital assets to kickstart your next creative project. They have everything from graphic and video templates for your favorite tools such as Premiere Pro, After Effects, DaVinci Resolve and others, to stock footage, graphic elements, music tracks, sound effects, 3D models, fonts, website templates and a ton more. They offer a really simple licensing model that gives you full commercial rights to any asset you download with some reasonable clauses like you can't resell them of course and that license remains valid even after your subscription has ended. You can sign up to either a monthly or an annual subscription, both giving you access to an unlimited number of downloads across all of the assets and I'll drop you a special link down in the video description that will give you 50% off if you choose the annual plan. And if you're unsure why not sign up for a free account. You get 12 free assets every month and you can upgrade your account at any time you want. But now I feel like I've really waffled on forever. Let's finally jump into the tutorial. Welcome to Blender. This is the final effect that we will be setting up. So you've got a monkey and a sphere and if you grab and move the sphere, you can see that that changes the color on the monkey wherever it is near the sphere. And by the way, no, I'm not fobbing you and just showing you the same thing I showed you in part two, which was object proximity. I'm going to assume that you know how proximity works in geometry nodes and we're going to use it to drive color because you do need a little bit of extra setup to make all of this work. As always, if you do just want to play with this file, you can download it from our website. So simply go to surfacestudio.com forward slash downloads. And as always, I'll just drop you the links in the video description as well. So you can just grab that and play around. Now, if you are starting out with the file that I have already set up, if you select the monkey and come into the geometry nodes workspace, there's quite a few different things set up here. So right now, this is the proximity node setup. If you select the monkey head down here, there's an option for color by value. And if you just select that color, and connect it to the output. You can see you can color the monkey just by a value. You can also use the one color by normal. Again, just select this yellow image output here and connect it into your color. And this is going to color your monkey based on the normal. Then you've got color by texture. Again, let's grab that, connect it. If you press space, this will come to play back like a Voronoi texture color animation right there. And at the bottom, you've got color by proximity. So if you grab that one, and connect it to the output color. You can see that's the proximity color setup right there. But again, we're going to go through how to set all of this up step by step in this tutorial. So let's return to the layout panel, select the monkey, press X to delete that. And you can delete the sphere as well. Now I've actually linked a light to the sphere. So if you come up into the options here and show the extras, you can see all of the lights and inside the sphere, I've got another light linked up, which just adds a bit of interest. So you can delete the sphere and create your own, but you can also just keep it and use it. Let me just hide the extras again. And let's get my ugly face out of the picture and let's get started. First off, let's add a new monkey head into our scene, G and Z, and let's just move that up just a little bit, come into geometry notes with the monkey head selected, press new in the geometry node editor to create a new geometry node graph. And by default, this does absolutely nothing. Now let's return to the layout workspace, make sure the monkey is selected and come into the material tab on the bottom right hand side. And let's assign a new material to this monkey and press new. Let's call this one monkey underscore mat. And the material itself has a base color here, which right now is set to white. Obviously you can change that to anything that you want, but this property is externally controlled. You're, it's, it's a property on the material, not on the geometry nodes. So with the monkey selected, back into geometry nodes, we now want to generate a color in our graph and feed that into the base color of our material. Now in the previous tutorials, we've looked at creating inputs into our geometry node graph, but we can also add 
outputs. So we can output a new attribute, we can call it whatever we want to, and then connect it to material properties or particle settings or anything else that we want really. So in the geometry node editor, make sure you can see the panel on the right hand side, reveal or hide with N. And by the way, you can see the keyboard shortcuts on the left hand side right here, come into the group. And now I want to add a new output. So let's hit plus on the outputs to add a new output to our graph. Come down, I'm going to change the type from float over to color because I want to output a color. And my name is output right now, let's call it GM for geometry notes, color. And feel free to use the US spelling if you prefer. And by default, this will be the attribute on a point that gets output and I'm fine with that. Now again, with the monkey head still selected, in the modifiers tab in our geometry notes setting, you now have these output attributes. Let's expand this. And there's a GM color attribute that's being output, but it's not mapped to anything. We need to give it a name so we can actually access it in the rest of Blender. You could of course just keep calling it GM color, but I feel like that's a little bit confusing on what you need to connect to what. So let's call this one monkey color, hit enter. And that's just the name of the attribute that we need to use in Blender to refer to this attribute. Control and C, let's copy this name. Make sure you're not getting the spelling wrong anywhere. Let's return to the layout tab, come into the material tab if you're not already there. And on this base color here, let's click on the yellow dot to connect an input into what drives this base color. And under the inputs, you should have an attribute. So we can feed an attribute to drive this color. Let's select attribute, a monkey changed to a bit of a weird color type can remain geometry, that is totally fine. And let's change the name over to monkey color. Hit enter. And now our monkey has gone black because by default, in geometry nodes, the output of our GM color is black. So this GM color output property now flows into the monkey color attribute on the monkey head, which in our material itself drives the base color. If at the top you come into the shading workspace, you can have a look at the shader itself. So let's zoom in at the bottom here on the shader graph. You can see how we've now connected our monkey color attribute into the base color of the material. And the cool thing is that in your geometry nodes, you can output all sorts of attributes and connect them in here to drive, you know, the emission or the normal or anything else. So they're really, really flexible and just a whole lot of fun to use. So let's come back into our geometry nodes setup. And by the way, make sure you actually in rendered shading mode or at least material preview. If you're in solid shading or wireframe, you're obviously not going to actually see the material. So I'm just going to go into rendered shading mode. So it just looks a little bit nicer. And let's change our boring monkey head to actually have some color. So on this group output, let me just make this a little bit bigger. Let's click onto this yellow diamond for the GM color input, drag that to the left and let go. I'm going to search for color. And what I want is this color arrow color property here. Drop that in, this is going to give me a color picker and I'm just feeding that into my GM color attribute. So now I can change the color in my geometry nodes to be whatever we want. So we could make this like a nice yellowy orange. Not the most exciting thing, but we certainly can. We're obviously not confined to just feeding constant values into this. We can derive this color value from anything we want. For example, we could use the normal vector or the distance from the origin or anything at all to drive it. So in the geometry nodes tree, shift and A, come into search. And let's just search for the normal. It's really common to show the color of the normals. Let's just drop that down here at the bottom. And the normal is a vector in 3D space that faces outwards from every face and every point on your 3D mesh. And because it is a vector, it has an X, Y, and Z coordinate, which really nicely mapped to the red, green, and blue of a color output. So I can actually take the output of this normal and feed that into the GM color property. And while there is a bit of a conversion, you can see that actually works. So now our monkey head is actually colored by the normal vector on this mesh. And if you wanted to make any tweaks or do anything weird with it, you can actually break this down. For that, if you go Shift and A, you come into the color category. There's a whole bunch of different nodes that are super useful, like a color ramp, combining RGBs, mixing, um, creating curves or separating RGB. Let's select separate RGB. Let's place that right after the normal. So we're breaking the X, Y, and Z of this normal apart. And right now only the red is getting fed into the color here because obviously the color expects a red, green, and blue input and we're just feeding the red in it. You could feed the green into it which only gives you the backside and the blue, which is only the other one. 
But again, we can combine them again. So shift and A, color, combine RGB, and let's connect this one in the middle. So you could swizzle them. So green could map to blue, red could map to green, whatever you wanted to, or you could use math and do all sorts of crazy stuff to drive the color for your mesh. Cool, that's a little bit more interesting, but what if we wanted to use a texture or some noise to you know, generate and animate some color on this mesh? For that, let's use a different setup. So let me just pull this over to the right hand side just a little bit, I might just collapse the color. Again, you can reconnect them all if you wanted to. I'm just going to drop them one by one as we go a little bit more complex. So Shift and A. I'm going to come down into texture and maybe let's use a Voronoi texture. Let's drop that down here on the left. And the Voronoi texture has a distance output, a color and a position, but the main one I'm interested in is the color. And you can see that matches really nicely to the yellow on our GM color output. Let's just connect that in on the right hand side. And that looks pretty funky. Now you can see that this is pretty rough and that's because we are pulling the attribute of every vertex. So wherever there's a big face, there's not a whole lot of detail. And what we might do in the geometry notes, come to the beginning and after this group input, shift and A, go for search. Let's go into subdivide mesh and let's place that right after our input just to subdivide that mesh a little bit more. Maybe I'll give it two levels. Don't drive this too high. You might crash Blender or your computer if it can't handle it. So there you go. You now have a pretty patchy looking monkey face. You can come into this Voronoi texture and obviously tweak a whole bunch of these parameters. Let's change the texture from 3D to 4D. So that we get a really nice W parameter that we can, if you drag this right, you can animate to create some really funky effects here. I'm also going to change this from F1 over to smooth F1, which is just going to apply a bit of blending so it doesn't look quite so harsh and blocky. It just looks a little bit nicer. And then obviously you can play with the scale or any other property that you want to control how this color looks. Now in order to animate it, simply click onto this W parameter here. And again, like we did in the very first part of the series, you can just use a frame to drive some of these parameters without keyframes. So pound or hash frame. Let's divide this maybe by say 50. Shift and left arrow to rewind and let's press space to display this back and see what happens. Cool, and you can now see this Voronoi effect and this texture animating over your monkey head. If you don't like the color that comes out of this Voronoi texture, you can just remap a value in here to anything you want. For example, the distance parameter is really just a floating point value, but you can remap that to anything using the color ramp node. So Shift and A, come into the color category and in here you'll find the color ramp node. Let's just drop that down here. Let's take the distance of the Voronoi texture and feed that in as the factor for the color ramp. And the output color of this one, I'm now going to stick into GM color. Now it doesn't look terribly interesting, but we can now control how this input color is mapped to an output color. So for example, I can determine the patchiness, but I can also just add more color into it. Let's say the darkest areas, I want black, but then I want it to go red next. So let's add another color stop into our color ramp. Let me just drag that to the left a little bit. Let's change the color over to red. That doesn't look too bad. Maybe pull the black one over a little bit more so we get a little bit more of that pronounced black highlights down in there. Let's add yet another color stop. Drag this one to the right of red. And again, just do whatever you want in here. This is not really going to be prescriptive. It's going to go with like a slightly desaturated yellow. I'll give it a bit of a flamey kind of look. Just spread that out a little bit more and maybe the white just a little bit more pronounced, a bit more red into it. And again, obviously you tweak this however you want to. And you can always come in here and you know adjust the scale of the Voronoi effect or maybe the smoothness on the blending or how random you want this to look. And again, if we play this back, you now have this animated noise texture assigned to your monkey and it's all driven from the geometry node itself. And finally, in a bit of a flashback to the last part of the series where we worked with object proximity, let's use the proximity to this sphere here to drive the color on this monkey head. If you don't have this sphere, simply shift an A and just create a new UV sphere and call it whatever you want to. Maybe in the outliner, I'm going to call it color sphere just so that I can recognize it. And again, as I said, I've just linked a light directly into it. So we now have this color sphere here. Let's reselect the monkey head, come in a little bit, 
Control, right click and drag to cut that fine line. You don't really need to, we're gonna replace it, but sometimes I find it easier to know that I've severed what I had before and I can just kind of start with a clean setup. So let's just pull all of this up a little bit, make a bit of space just so it's a bit easier to see. Let me zoom in again. And as we did on the last part, let's come into the group input. Make sure you can see the panel with N. Let's add a new input. I'm going to change the type over to be an object. I'm going to rename this one to color source, come into the modifiers tab. And for my color source, I'm actually going to select my color sphere or whatever other object you want to use to drive that input. Obviously we need to convert it to some geometry. So let's click and drag from this color source to the right. And yes, I want to drop an object info node right here. So that looks good so far. The geometry here, I'm going to click and drag to the right. And I'm now going to connect that to a geometry proximity node. And I want to feed that into the target property on that. Source position, I still need to define. And I want to use the position of all of these points. And you can either capture the attribute of the mesh itself, or we can actually just connect a position property in here because I'm just going to pull the position of the point itself. So let's pull that over to the right hand side. Distance is going to be a floating point output of the distance to the sphere, but we need to convert it to a color. And again, for that, we can use the color ramp. So shift and A, come to search. Let's search for color ramp. Let's drop that down here. The distance will become the factor. And then the color output of that is going to go into our GM color. If you grab the sphere, move it around, Besides the light, nothing really happens. And that's because again, reselect the monkey. Our object info is still set to original. So let's set that to relative. So if you now grab the sphere and move it. Now the light is actually a little bit confusing. So I'm going to delete that out of my color sphere. I think it just makes it a bit harder to see what's actually going on. So if you now move the sphere, you can see that the monkey head gets darker where that sphere is. Let's reselect the monkey. And now in the color ramp, we can control what maps to what. I'm actually going to invert the white and the black. So everything closer to the sphere is going to go white. It's kind of like it's almost being illuminated. But what I might do is on the monkey head, maybe the far color, the black, I'm going to change to like a really darkish desaturated blue. Anything super close goes white, but let's add another color stop, bring that a little bit closer. And again, let's just change that to like a bright yellow. I'm going to give it a bit more intensity as well. Let's add another color stop, pull that over and make that red. I kind of like fire, so everything always ends up being a little bit of a red, green, blue kind of effect for me. So let's make the center a bit brighter. And now if you grab the sphere and move it, you now are driving the color of this monkey head based on the proximity from the sphere. And it's all being driven by outputting the color as an attribute and then using that attribute as an input on one of your materials. And as I've mentioned, you can feed this into any part of your shader. You can drive emission, specularity, glossiness, ambient occlusion, or other bits and pieces in Blender that take attributes for inputs. You can drive them with this setup. So simply create an attribute output, make sure you name it appropriately, and then use the name of that particular output attribute. And then you can use that to drive the color of your meshes or any other property in Blender that you can drive with an attribute. It's really not that complicated to set up, but it unlocks a huge amount of possibilities and just cool stuff you can do with geometry nodes in Blender. And that is all there is to it. I really hope you enjoyed this tutorial and please don't forget to like and subscribe if you would like to see more. All and any useful links you will find in the video description and please leave any comments, questions or suggestions down below. And with that, thank you very much for watching and until next time, I will see you later.